الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين لا سيما الإمام المبين والكهف الحصين وغياث المضطر المستكين ولي نعمتنا وسيدنا ومولانا الحجة ابن الحسن فداه أرواح العالمين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك وأناخت برحلك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اتقوا الله فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم So keep your duty to Allah as best as you can Please recite aloud salawat. We've been ingrained with exceptional and incredible capabilities. Whenever you hit a wall, you reach a dead end, you should know that you have the potential to reach new heights, but you just need to explore these capabilities. You need to believe. Once you believe, you're halfway there. Let me give you a few examples. We have a tendency to look at our limits and look at our weaknesses instead of our capabilities. But once you extract these capabilities, you could reach new heights, as I said. We always tend to think that there is a limit as to how much we could endure, how much patience we can display when we are faced with difficulties, hardships, problems, we opt out because we think that there is little we can do. We cannot endure any more than anything more than that. But we are wrong. A group of people decided to make an experiment. They started making phone calls, calling a group of people, making an offer for a job. They told them that we have a job, op job opening if you're interested. They began to describe the job. They said that the job description is that you need to be available and accessible 24-7, 365 days a year. And you need to be willing to do everything that you can do. You have to be willing to cook, to clean, to wash, and basically do everything. And you have to be receptive to complaint. People will nag. But you have no right to complain. You have no right to nag. And no one will appreciate your job. And there is a twist to this job. Your salary is zero. So they all declined and turned down the offer, of course. When they turned down the offer, they were introduced to motherhood. That's what mothers do, right? And they calculated the amount of money that mothers deserve if they were to be paid on an hourly basis for the type, for the kind of work that they do. 
for the kind of effort that they exert. They said that their salary should be upwards of a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So all you need to do is believe in yourself and try to explore these capabilities to understand that your level of endurance is much greater beyond your wild imaginations. Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayha, true, she was the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the daughter of Fatima al-Zahra, but she didn't have extraordinary powers. Yes, she had deep conviction and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what she had. But apart from that, she was just another lady, another woman. The sufferings that she witnessed, the tragedies that she witnessed, the pain, the excruciating pain that she experienced is just like anything that any other woman would experience if they go through the same thing that Lady Zainab went through. She witnessed the killing of all her brothers, all her family members, 17 of the Hashemites that were killed on the day of Ashura. Her brothers, Abul Fadl Abbas and his brothers, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, she witnessed when they slaughtered Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And then what she witnessed in the aftermath wasn't any less than the actual tragedy that happened on the day of Ashura. She was taken as, as a captive to Kufa, and she was in charge of all the women, all the children. She became the standard bearer of Imam al Hussein because Imam Zain al Abidin couldn't take that role. They would have killed him. So it was Lady Zainab who was in the forefront. She's taken to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. She goes to, the, to Kufa. Look at what she said when Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad said to her that, how do you find the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treated you? She said, Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. I did not see but beauty. That's what I saw. So the capacity that every woman has. Now Lady Zainab wasn't an imam. Even if she was an imam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he was, when the prophets were asked that we want prophets that are angels and not humans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds by saying that even if I was to send an angel, that angel will be in the form of a human being. Why? So you could imitate them. So they could be your role models. So what Rasulullah went through, what Amir al-Mu'mineen went through, they experienced the same pain that any other human being would experience. One day, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam comes to the Prophet and he grabs his right leg. Imam al Hussein grabs his left leg. Archangel Gabriel comes down. He says to him, Ya Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has issued a decree that Imam al Hasan is poisoned. He's going to be given poison. He's going to be martyred. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam will be slain in the way of God. He will be martyred. He will be butchered. He will be beheaded. So the Prophet cried. Gabriel said to him that you as a Prophet, you can pray to God. You can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your prayers are answered. You can tell him to waive these tragedies from your grandchildren. But the Prophet said, I am pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he decrees, he decrees for a reason. He wants to save the nation. He wants to save the Muslims. He wants to save humanity. That's why Imam al Hussein has to go through what he went through. So the pain that Rasulullah goes through when he heard that his own grandson will be beheaded is a pain that any human being would experience, would feel, even though he's a prophet. Sometimes when you hear about people, pro people's problems, people think that you know, this is too much. I can't take it anymore. But they're usually wrong. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never burden anyone with tragedies, with tribulations, more than his capacity. لَنْ يُكَلِّفَ اللَّهِ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا According and in proportion to your capacity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you face difficulties and, and hardships. When it comes to sins, 
One might say that in this day and age, it's literally impossible. It's just difficult to not to give in to temptation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proves us wrong. How? Through the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam was only 16 as I mentioned one night. He is faced with this sin. He's only 16 and the woman that is trying to lure him is the most beautiful woman in town, Zulaikha. He's all alone inside that hall. But he said, The hadith says that on the day of judgment, a youth will be brought that contaminated himself with the sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, why did you contaminate yourself? That youth will say that you should excuse me. I was handsome. The circumstances dictated that I give in to this temptation. I was aroused. I had strong desires. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summons Yusuf, he said, look at this man. He was only 16. Yes, he was a prophet, but he was a human being. He had the same temptations that you had. He was faced with a test more difficult than your test. You lost, he won. You failed in that test, although you had the capability to win in that test. If a woman is contaminated, contaminates herself with the sin, and she says, Ya Ilahi, I was beautiful. It was just difficult, too difficult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring Maryam ibn Imran, who lived in a society that didn't have any principles and ideals. They were free to do whatever they wanted to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak to that woman, to that young lady. Were you more beautiful or Maryam? She would admit that Maryam is more beautiful than me. Her test was more difficult or your test? Your circumstances were more difficult or her, her circumstances? They would admit that her circumstances was much more difficult than my circumstances. Then why didn't you? Why did you yield and submit to your desire while Maryam didn't? Wa Maryam ibn Imran, allati Allah subhanahu wa taala makes reference to her chastity in the Quran. Ahsanat farjaha, fanafakhna fiha min ruhna. The second example, when it comes to the ibadat, how much you can worship Allah subhanahu wa taala? If you spend an hour worshiping God, you would think that you know. You've done the worship for the day. This is too much, one hour of worship. Imam Zayn al-Abideen, who was given the title of Zayn al-Abideen, the best amongst all worshippers when it comes to worshipping God. Imam al-Baqarah says one day he was going through the notes of Amir al-Mu'mineen, saying how much Amir al-Mu'mineen worshipped God. So he went through the notes of the Imam, then he threw the book. He said, وَمَنْ يَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ عَلِي Who can imitate Ali ibn Abi Talib? Imam Ali alayhi salam was a leader of a nation. He was the chief judge. And he was accessible to all the people in, the, in his community. After sunrise, he would allow everyone, anyone that wants anything. People would come with questions. Beggars would come asking for money. He was usually surrounded by hundreds of people after Salat, after Tulu al-Shams, after sunrise. Chief judge, he led an army. He was in a state of war. He had 10 children or more. With all these responsibilities, the Imam dug wells. Most of the wells in Medina were dug by Amir al-Mu'mineen Most of the palm trees were sown by Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And despite all of that, كان يصلي في اليوم والليلة ألف ركعة. He would offer to God one thousand rak'at in the twenty-four hour cycle. وكانوا قليلا من الليل ما يهجعون. He would only spend, he would spend the entire night praying. He would spend the day fasting to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. He only spent, he only slept briefly. During the day. You might say that this is Amir al Mu'mineen. Who can become like Amir al Mu'mineen? Who can imitate Amir al Mu'mineen? I had a teacher who passed away, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. He used to 
sleep only three hours in the 24 hour cycle. And he used to say that I've lived double my life, twice my life. He died when he was 50, but the work that he did, the efforts that he exerted were equal to someone that lived a hundred years. And he spent every waking moment either teaching or writing a hadith or uh, teaching his students in the, in the hawza. And he would sometimes, when he wanted to take a nap, he would sleep on a rough surface. Why? He says, because if I sleep on a mattress or on the bed, the comfort of the bed will make me sleep more. This is why I have to sleep on a rough surface so that I wake up and attend to my, to my duties. Now, one might say that if you get enough sleep, at least eight hours a day, this would boost your immune system. You get to live longer, right? You, you get to live longer, but the extra years that you're given, if you sleep eight hours, if you get enough sleep every day, will be spent while you're asleep. So these people spared no effort in fulfilling their duties towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or when it comes to your manners, you might say that, what can I do? When my parents, for example, are angry, when they say something and they hurt me, I have to respond. No, you don't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the ability to stay silent. Again, because of the verse, لَنْ يُكَلِّفَ اللَّهَ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا You have the ability to stay silent and just smile. Even if they hurt you, even if they swear at you, even if they slander, you should still remain silent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Do as best as you can when it comes to piety, when it comes to fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This night is dedicated to whom? To Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam An infallible Imam would stand before his tomb and recite a ziyara. One of the passages mentioned in the ziyara is, I bear witness that you You spared no effort. You exerted all the effort that you had to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Imam says that the Balfadl al-Abbas is special. He stands out. He doesn't only stand out generally. He stands out from amongst the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The cream of the crop, Abu al Fadl Abbas stands out. And on the day of judgment, the position that he'll be occupying, all the martyrs on the day of judgment, that includes all the prophets, all the prominent figures in history, Hamza, Ja'far, they will all wish if they were in the position of Abu al Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam. And then the Imam says, He had knowledge, he had insight. I usually say this about Abu al-Fadl Abbas. I say that if, if Abu al-Fadl Abbas was to come back to life again and see how great he's become in the eyes of all the masses, He's loved by tens of millions of people today. And then travels back in time to relive Ashura. Abu al-Fadl Abbas wouldn't be able to do more than what he already did on the day of Ashura. This is because of his basira. Nafid al-Basira. He was able to diagnose his duty, his responsibility. After the diagnosis, he spared no effort. He gave away everything. His eyes, his head, his two hands, and the blood of his heart for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the imam of his time. وَكَانَ صَلْبَ iman. His faith was unshakable. The hadith says that a mu'min is stronger than a mountain. Why? فَإِنَّ الْجَبَلَا يُنْتَقَصُ مِنْهِ a mountain, you could break the rocks, you could take from the soil of the mountain. But a mu'min's iman is unshakable. 
No one can take from his faith, from his religion. See, this is how the order of our priorities should be. You should protect your health and prosperity, shield it with your money. You should then shield your religion, your faith, with your prosperity and health. But if this order is changed, and you shield your money with your health, you're doomed. If you shield your dunya, your prosperity, with your religion, you are doomed. O oh, lovers of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, isn't it shameful that we have the examples of Abbas and the likes of Ali al-Akbar? These are the greatest inspirations in the world. And yet, when it comes to our faith, we do things on the expense of our religion, on the expense of our faith. A desire here, greed over there, a temptation here. And we have the examples of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. This is what makes him a great man that Imam al-Sadiq salutes and says, Salam Allah wa salamu malaikatihi al muqarrabin Upon you, O son of Amir al muminin This is how great Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was. Once Imam Zayn al-Abdin saw the son of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. His name was Ubaidullah. When he looked at him, he cried. And then he said, that the Prophet faced a lot of tribulations. He witnessed the death of his uncle Hamza. And you all know how much the Prophet cried, what the Prophet did when he was killed. Then he witnessed the martyrdom of his cousin Ja'far. But then Imam Zayn al-Abidin says, Lakin la yawmaka yawmaka ya Aba Abdullah. The tragedy of Imam al-Hussein is unmatched. Then he mentions the example of Abbas. He makes, makes that comparison between Abbas and Hamza, and then he says, لا يومك يومك You can't compare Hamza and Ja'far to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. You can't compare their tragedies to, to the tragedy of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. لكن المؤمن لا ينتقص من إيمانه. You can't take away from his faith. You can't. Let me give you an example how this was demonstrated in Karbala. On the 9th of Muharram, a man comes from the city of Kufa and he calls the name of Abbas and his brothers. Who are you? He said, I'm a messenger. Who sent you? An uncle of Abu al-Fadl Abbas sent me. Abu al-Fadl Abbas goes, he has a letter. What's the content of the letter? His uncle says that I went and met with Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and I was able to procure an impunity for you and your brothers to be exempt from punishment. All you need to do is leave the camp of Hussein and you will be exempt. You could live, just leave Hussein. What was Abbas's response? He said, Ablig Khali as salam. Convey my salams to my uncle. And, he, and tell him, لا حاجة لي ب, لنا بأمانكم. I don't need your impunity. أمان الله خير من أمان ابن سمية. God's impunity, God's protection, God's guarantees to me is superior to the impunity of the son of سمية. Everyone knew who سمية was. She was a wicked woman. خير من أمان ابن سمية. Umar ibn Sa'd was hesitant to fight against Imam al Hussein. Why? Because he knew who Imam al Hussein was. That's why he kept sending letters to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad asking him to delay the war. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who was the vicious ty tyrant that you know, he sent Shimr ibn al Jawshan, who arrived on the day, on the 9th of Muharram, with a thousand armed men. He comes, he meets with Umar ibn Sa'd with a letter from Ubaidullah. He says to him that I didn't send you to give, to tell Hussein that I will protect you, you will not be killed. You either do as you are told and kill Hussein, or you should give the standard to Shimr ibn al to, to fulfill his duty. Umar ibn Sa'd was very reluctant. But because he was greedy, because of his attachment to this dunya, 
he said, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll kill Hussein. So Shimr ibn al-Jawshan then walks towards the battlefield. It was before the, the war. It was on the 9th of Muharram. And then he calls out, Aina banu ukhtina? Where are the children of our sister? He meant Umm al banin because he was a distant relative of Umm al banin He was from the tr same tribe that Umm al banin uh, belonged to. Aina banu ukhtina? Imam al Hussein was sitting with Abu al-Fadl Abbas and his brothers and his companions. So they didn't respond. Imam al Hussein said, who is he? He sounds like Shimr. They said, yes, he's Shimr ibn al Jawshan. The Imam said, respond to him, even though he's a wicked man. So Abu al-Fadl Abbas gets up. He goes out of the tent. What? No salam, no nothing. What? Shimr says, that I managed to secure an impunity. They were trying relentlessly to break off the brotherhood between Hussein and Abu al-Fadl Abbas. Because every prophet, our prophet, Musa, Isa, alayhi salam, they all had someone standing beside them, supporting them. Musa had Harun. Our prophet had Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. Hussein had Abbas. So they wanted to break the brotherhood between the two. He said that I, I managed to secure the impunity from Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. With one condition, you submit to the rule of the Emir of Ubaidullah. Now, Abu al-Fadl Abbas could have said that let me consult my brothers, let me consult Hussein, let me think about it. But if you, if you, do, if you give no room to shaitan to come and enter inside your mind, if you're determined, shaitan won't be able to deceive you. But if you're in doubt, that's when shaitan can enter into your heart. What was Abbas's response? He immediately responded. He said, You give us impunity while the child of Rasulullah has no impunity, has no protection. May God curse you and your impunity. Shimr ibn al Joshan was enraged. He went back to his camp. Zuhair ibn al Qayn said, Ya Abu al Fadl, these words and this impunity, could these words shake you? He said, Look, Ya Zuhair, when the war starts, you'll see wonders. You'll see wonders. Now, even though Abu al Fadl Abbas never had the chance to fight, he went to bring water. But more than 70 books of maqtal, 70 different reporters, they're not Shias, the majority of them are not Shias. They all agree that the number of people that were guarding the Euphrates were from 4,000 to 6,000 people. No one says that they were less than this number. 4,000 to 6,000. When Abu al-Fadl Abbas السلام, went to bring water, they all ran away from Abbas. All the maqatil mention that. That was on the 9th of Muharram. On the eve of Ashura, a few hours later, while Abbas was guarding the tents, Abbas was guarding the tents because the enemies they expressed desire to raid the tents and fight, even in the middle of the night. That's why Abbas was vigilant, was wary. While he was roaming around the tents, when all of a sudden he sees that there is a shadow lurking behind him. Who could it be? Could it be an enemy combatant? Who knows? So he swiftly goes to see who it is. He finds a woman coming out of the tent. Who is this woman? Why should a woman leave the tent in the middle of the night? He comes closer only to find his sister Zainab. Ukhtah Zainab, maladhi akhraja ki fi sawadi hadhi al-layla. What brought you out of the tent in the middle of the night? When I'm guarding the tent, you could sleep comfortably. But after I go, and you need that sleep. Because after I go, you will spend a lot of sleepless nights. Lady Zainab 
said, Akhi Abbas, I want to tell you a story. So he says to her, this is the best time to talk to me because tomorrow might not be able to talk. He wanted to alight from the back of his horse when she said to him, I want you to stay on the back of your horse. I want to see you in that position. So brave, so good looking, so courageous. Stay on the back of your horse while I tell you the story. And then Sayyidah Zainab began telling him the story of the aftermath of the death of Fatima al-Zahra. She said, Akhi Abbas, when, our mother, when my mother Fatima al-Zahra passed away, our father Amir al-Mu'mineen was looking for a wife, but this wife had to have special qualities. So he came to his brother Aqil, who was a genealogist. He knew about the traits of the Arabs and the Arabian tribes. So he comes to his brother, he says to him, Akhi Aqil, I'm looking for a woman, I want to marry a woman with specific characteristics and qualities. What are you looking for, Akhi Amir al muminin He said, I want to marry a woman who is bred by a heroic, brave tribe. And Jabat al Fuhulatu min al Arab. Aqil thought for a moment, then he said, Then you're looking for Fatim al Kilabiya, Umm al Banin. Then he said to him, why? He said, because there will come a day when my son Hussein will be all alone in Karbala. I want to conceive a child to stand with him, to support him. So Amir al muminin proposes to Umm al-Bani. They get married and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with four beautiful children. Abbas was the eldest. She finished the story. Then she held the rein of his horse with her right hand and pointed out to the tent with her left hand. And then she said, Akhi Abbas, Al Haram Haramuk. These women are your women as well. These noble sisters are also your sisters. These children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam are also under your protection. فَلَا تُقَصَّرْ عَنْ نُصْرَتِنَا I don't want you to leave us, O oh Abbas. She wasn't testing him. She just wanted to boost his morale. She wanted to encourage him. فَلَا تُقَصَّرْ عَنْ نُصْرَتِنَا Don't leave us, O oh Abbas. When he heard these words from his sister Zainab, he unsheathed his sword and shook it in her face. He pushed into the stirrup of the horse until he broke it, until it was severed. And then he said, Ukhtah Zainab, atushajjainani wa ana ibn man ta'rifin. Are you trying to encourage me while you know that I am the son of Ali? I inherited his traits. I will not betray you. That's why when we visit Abu al-Fadl Abbas, what do we say? Salamullah wa salamu malaikatihi al-muqarrabin wa al-tayyibat fi ma taghtadi wa taruhu alayka yabn amir al-mu'mineen. We say to him, O oh son of amir al-mu'mineen, may God's peace and blessings be upon you. The characteristics of Amir al muminin were reflected on your personality. That's why he said to her, You'll be delighted of what you'll see of me tomorrow. The day of Ashura. In the afternoon. It was in the afternoon. After the martyrdom of all the companions of Abu Abdullah. Abu al-Fadl Abbas knew it was his turn. But it was so difficult to seek permission from the, from the Imam. Because after he leaves, there is no one staying with the Imam. When Ali al-Akbar left, Abbas was there, Qasim was there, the Hashemites were there. But the most difficult decision to make was Abu al-Fadl Abbas' decision. Because if he leaves, Imam al Hussein would be alone. All alone, surrounded by these vicious monsters. But... That's the only option that he had. So he comes to Imam al-Hussein. He says to him, Akhi Aba Abdullah, 
Would you give me permission to go to the battlefield? The Imam looks at him. He says to him, Akhi Abbas, you're the monument of my army. You're my standard bearer. You're the epicenter of my army. Everyone follows your lead. If you go, we will be defeated. You're everything to me, Abbas. It was difficult for the Imam to give him the permission. Instead, the Imam did something else. Although he knew this, that this will result in the killing of Abu al-Fadl Abbas. He said to him, In kana wa la bud, If you need to go, at least go and fetch some water for these kids and children. For these children. Abu al-Fadl Abbas agrees. So he takes the container. The standard goes on the back of his horse and goes towards the Euphrates. Four to six thousand people were guarding the river. They all escape. They all flee. He enters inside the water. What would you naturally do? Thirsty, wounded, it's so hot. You would naturally drink from the water without thinking. So he placed his hands in the water and he filled them with water. As he was about to drink, he remembered the thirst of Aba Abdullah. So he recited this poem. Ya nafs, min ba'dil Husayni huni. I shouldn't even live after Aba Abdullah. Wa qablahu la kunti aw takuni. While Hussein is drinking from the cup of martyrdom of death, you are drinking from the cup, you are quenching your thirst here. Then he threw the water on the water, filled the container, and then went back towards the tent. But he t didn't take the normal route. He went through the palm trees. When Umar ibn Sa'ad called out, block him. Don't let the water reach the tents. For if their thirst is quenched, they will wipe us out. These two together. So a wicked man, now they all charged. They all came to this side to block Abel Fadl al-Abbas. Abel Fadl al-Abbas's aim was to deliver the water. That's his only aim. He wasn't there to fight. A wicked man hides behind the palm tree. When Abel Fadl al-Abbas passes by, he strikes the sword on his right hand, severing it. Abel Fadl al-Abbas recited the poem, By God, if you sever my right hand, I will still defend my religion. I will still defend my Imam, the Imam of my time. And then another man hid behind another tree. When Abel Fadl al-Abbas passed by, he struck him with the sword on his right arm. فَقَطَعَهَا مِنَ الزَّنْدِ قَدْ قَطَعُوا بِبَغِيهِمْ يَسَارِ with their transgression, they severed my left hand as well. May God make them taste the inferno. But he was still proceeding towards the tent. When a wicked man by the name of Harmalat ibn Kahil al -Asadi. You know that name? Whenever the Hashemites, the woman, heard the name Harmala, their heart would break. It changes their mood. Because Harmala had three arrows that he used on the day of Ashura. One that penetrated through the thorax of Ali al-Azghar. One that penetrated through the container of water. One that penetrated through the heart of Abu Abdullah. Three arrows that he used. So Harmala ibn Kahil al-Asadi shoots an arrow. It pierces the water container. When the water spills on the ground, Abel Fadl Abbas suddenly stops. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't have hands to fight with. How should he meet Sukaina? With severed hands? He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't have water to deliver to the tents. He doesn't have hands to fight with. So he stops for a moment thinking, what should I do? When another arrow was shot, piercing the eyes of Abel Fadl al Abbas. Abel Fadl al Abbas used his severed hands to take out the arrow from, from his right 
cry when his helmet fell on the ground a wicked man came from behind and struck him with an iron rod on his head historians tell us that he his body had become like a hedgehog from the number of arrows that were piercing his armor he fell on the ground calling out Akhi Adrik Akhaq Oh Aba Abdullah come to my rescue Imam Al Hussein rides on the back of his horse, rushes towards Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas. Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas's eye is covered with blood. He couldn't see, but he felt someone coming close to him, approaching. He thought it was an enemy combatant that had come to finish him. So he says to him, "Uqsimu alayka bima ta'bud." I ask you in the name of the Lord that you worship. Just give me a few moments until my brother comes to bid farewell with me when Hussein said Ana khuk, I am your brother Hussein Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas surrendered his soul the enemies began to clap they began to laugh loudly Imam al-Hussein said Alan in kasara dhahri now my back is broken Alan shamut sabi'ad now I don't know what to do then he alighted on the back of his horse he charged at the enemies Omar ibn Sa'd said leave him just go away because his brother has just been killed so the Imam began calling out where are you escaping to you have just killed my brother but the Imam decided to go back to the tent. He alighted from the back of his horse. How was the Imam crying? They say usually when a woman cries, a woman cries loudly. When a man cries, usually they cry silently. But how do children cry? They would place their arm on their eyes. He was wiping his tears with his his arm. Lady Zainab couldn't ask Hussein what happened to Abbas. Why did you come alone? So she sent Sukaina. Sukaina, ask your father what happened to my uncle. She comes out. Abba, halak almun bi al Abbas. Do you know what happened to my uncle Abbas? The Imam doesn't respond to her. She goes to the tent of Abbas. He removes the pole of the tent. The tent falls on the ground. He gives. لها يسكن راح أبا راح الضغم اللي يرفع الراس the woman came out of the tents calling out wa abbasah wa dhay'atana ba'dak ya aba al-fadl so imam al-hussein said the same thing he said wa abbasah wa dhay'atana ba'dak ya aba al-fadl لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون والعاقبة للمتقين وقف الصلاه to رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم after reciting the tragedy of Abu al-Fadl is praying for the haste reappearance of Imam al-Zaman Allah Ta'ala Farajahu al-Sharif to avenge the blood of Imam al hussein and his companions. So please let's recite together. Stand up and recite. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma kun li waliyika al ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka. 